Hi everyone, my name is Ros Hopman and uh, I'm presenting today from Amsterdam. And today I want to share some insights with you from my research on forensic DNA phenotyping, on the different logics of forensic DNA phenotyping in particular. And I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam. I'm part of the Race Face ID project where we look at how race is enacted in forensic identification technologies. So we look at three different technologies uh, that are each used to give face to an unknown suspect. And we look at how uh, race becomes a part of this identification process. So first of all, uh, we look at forensic DNA phenotyping. Then someone else is working on craniofacial reconstructions. And finally, um, we have someone working on facial composite sketches as done by the police. Uh, today, I'm not going to talk so much about race, but um, to look at the different kinds of practices that are related to forensic DNA phenotyping or where it plays a part in. And I hope this is not too repetitive, but forensic DNA phenotyping is a technology that can be used in cases where there are no eyewitnesses or other leads, but uh, DNA traces available. And in these cases, there are different kinds of physical traits that can be predicted. Uh, first of all, eye, hair, and skin color. Second, biogeographical ancestry, which is more indirect phenotyping because it tells you more about a suspect's um, ancestors and what geographical area they originate from. And then this is used to say something about their appearance. And finally, um, facial morphology, although this is still very much in the early stages of development because facial morphology is just genetically very complex. So my research has consisted of um, mainly ethnographic fieldwork, different settings, which means that I was a participant observer. And I've done this uh, within the Netherlands mainly. And I've spent two months at a forensic laboratory where they are working on the application of kits to actual uh, forensic DNA material. And then um, I've also spent two months at a research lab where they were developing the kits for application. Um, I've participated in some conferences on forensic DNA phenotyping, uh, some workshops. And in addition, I've conducted interviews with police officers. Now, because I had access to all these different settings and in moving in these different settings, I actually found that the practices that I encountered in these settings were informed um, by very different ideals and rationales and actually uh, just different concerns. And here or today, I want to articulate these concerns. Um, and show you um, what is happening in these different practices. And I do so um, by making use of the notion of uh, logics. As uh, Annemarie Moll, a uh, science and technology scholar, has um, proposed it. So she identified logics of practices. And a logic for her is uh, like a rationality or rather the rationale of the practices I'm studying. Here, the term logic helps. It asks for something that one might also call a style. It invites the exploration of what is appropriate or logical to do in some side or situation and what is not. So it seeks a local, fragile, and yet pertinent coherence. So what I wanna do in the rest of the presentation is to, for each of these, practices identify the kind of logic that they work by. And I want to start out in the research lab. So where they are working on identifying new genetic markers um, that they can incorporate into forensic kits. So they are looking for the most significant markers. And um, so far this work has led to predictions that are quite broad, uh, categorical. So for example, being able to say 
whether someone might have is more likely to have blue eyes or brown eyes but they are in these uh, settings in these labs but also in the technical literature i found that they are really looking to accumulate uh, data and genetic markers um, on that are behind or that are behind uh, physical traits to produce predictions that are ever more precise and then ultimately so the ideal of these practices is being able to predict individual specific phrases from dna so this would be the ultimate goal of fvp and the dream of police men and women and this is a quote by a leading um, scholar in the field and this ideal results in a practice that is ever expanding its scope. It's always looking for new genetic markers to identify um, and accumulating data on uh, genetic markers to increase precision and to increase accuracy of the predictions. Um, and I want to read to you a quote from a lecture that I attended from a uh, professor on molecular genetics that illustrates this logic of accuracy. So he was talking about um, a kit that he was developing. So obviously there are things to improve also on the eye and hair color because it's not perfect. We want to have it higher. So they want to have the accuracy higher. So therefore you do have to go back to the lab and actually you go back to a large number of individuals, 300,000, which you can't do in one day, which you can't do with normal money. And you actually found lots of new genes also for hair, hair color, where you think, oh, this can't be so complex. The thing is, the more of these gene you identify with this type of analysis, the smaller the effect size is. So that also means that the more genes you find, you need many more, because they individually have small effects, end quote. So in this logic of accuracy, individuality is the ultimate goal, yet it keeps slipping away in this ever increasing uh, detail of biomarkers. Because as I quoted here, with each novel marker that is identified, complexity increases further. Um, so this results in a practice that is always expanding the scope and it's grasping for something that is held out as possible that is practically probably unattainable and this is very different from what i found uh, the kind of concerns that i found in the forensic lab um, so here they are working with uh, forensic dna material and they are applying uh, FDP kits to predict uh, physical traits from that material. And what I immediately noticed when I um, conducted my fieldwork in this setting is that these uh, people are very limited in their choices by the lab machinery that they have, but also by the DNA material itself. So as these quotes here show, uh, they are limited, for example, by the maximum amount of fragments that we can put in and read from the PCR. So machinery poses limitations, but in addition, the DNA material that is available is often um, degraded, uh, it comes in complex mixtures, uh, or there is just um, not much of it. So what they need to do in this setting is to predict very few markers. So with the material that they have, predict few markers that can tell them a lot about a person. So to produce uh, useful results uh, within the limitations. Um, and this then results in a very different practice than the one that I just described. So they are trying to generate useful results, not by aiming for individual phenotypes, but by producing situated group specificity. And an example of such a method is the uh, haplogroup group method, which you see in the image on the right, um, where they actually try to situate an unknown suspect 
within a large, uh, broad geographical group, and then they can use this information to, um, or police can use this information to focus their investigation on a group of suspects. So it's not aiming for individuals, it's aiming for uh, embedding a suspect within a particular group. And then for that, they are looking for commonalities between the unknown person's DNA and that of groups, genetic groups that occur frequently within the Netherlands. So it's about how common uh, a particular haplogroup is within that context. And of course, they would like to add more specificity um, to their tests. But as I quote here at the bottom, then you would have to look at thousands of SNPs. So SNPs uh, are a particular genetic marker. And that costs a lot of money and time. So the haplogroup method that we use now is a cheap alternative. With the Y-SNP kit that we use, you can at least identify the main groups. And what they are hoping for specifically to find with these kits are um, rare results. So a haplogroup that doesn't occur frequently within the Dutch context, so that this can reduce the size of the population of interest. And with that, I want to move on to the police work. And uh, this is again another logic, which I call the logic of valuing. And I follow uh, Martin Inns, who um, says that police work is actually information work. So different pieces of evidence are weighed against each other to condense or narrow the pool of suspects. And here, for instance, the new phenotyping is a result, um, or these results are a clue among many. They're not, uh, the whole investigation doesn't revolve around DNA, but builds on different kinds of clues. And to illustrate this, and these are then um, weighed against each other, these different clues. And I want to illustrate that by reading a quote um, from an interview with police officers. And here they were telling me about an investigation where two women had been raped by the same uh, perpetrator, by the same man, but they described him differently. So I quote, one of the victims indicated it was a man of more or less Moroccan origin, let's say North Africa. While the other witness, the other victim, so raped by the same man, pointed in the direction of India. So an Indian appearance. And so as a tactical team leader, you therefore had to deal with two possible groups that were interesting to put on top of your list to investigate first. When you then use the DNA, and we did that, and you see a very clear indication in the direction of India. And additionally, you connect that to the fact that one of those two ladies was a stewardess and spoke of an Indian type. From that, you deduce that those people, stewardesses, do have a better view, we think, of where some people come from, from which parts of the world. So you attach more value to that. And so you focus more on that without losing the others from sight. But you have to make choices in the criminal investigation. And you do that based on the best information you have." End quote. So here you see that the DNA becomes a clue among many, and it is an important one, but it has to be uh, weighed against other pieces of information. And here, what becomes relevant uh, are also eyewitness accounts and the profession of one of the eyewitnesses. So the fact that she was a stewardess was taken in as relevant. And within the pressures of a criminal investigation, so within time pressure, uh, societal pressure, high specificity is not required. Because um, as these officers actually said themselves, they are not experts on uh, human diversity. Uh, for us, Chinese is not distinguishable from Japanese or Korean. Asian works better. That gives you very clear images immediately. So in the investigation, high specificity is actually not necessary. What works best for them is to get uh, at a type of suspect, in fact, because this is an open category that can then be adjusted to the specifics uh, of an inf investigation. So it can be interpreted in terms of that uh, pool of suspects that you're dealing with. I want to add 
very briefly something uh, from psychology to that because this research in psychology has shown that actually faces that are not exactly matching the face that you need to identify, but it is car caricatures that work better in identification. Like when you enlarge a distinctive features of a face, they are more easily recognizable. So it's actually not um, highly accurate depictions that then function best. And I see that I have to stop. So I'm gonna briefly conclude um, so here I've shown that there's the shifting focus where we move from the individual, uh, the genetically uni unique individual in the research lab to uh, establishing genetic groups in the forensic lab. And finally, uh, that being interpreted as a particular type of suspect in the police investigation. So we see how in the translations between these settings, race uh, slowly is introduced. And uh, importantly, I also show that there's a disconnect between the development side of forensic DNA phenotyping and forensic practice. So the accuracy that they are aiming for in the research lab is not what works best when we look at uh, forensic practice, the police and the forensic lab. Um, I'm hoping to talk these tensions through with you further. Uh, thank you for your attention and um, I look forward to your questions.